This video is on covalent bonding. We're going to look at drawing dot and cross diagrams, intermolecular forces, and giant molecular covalent substances. As mentioned, all atoms want to have a full outer shell. Hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. To have a full outer shell, it needs one more electron. On the right here, I've drawn another hydrogen atom. This time its electron is this blue circle. This hydrogen atom also requires one or more electron to have a full outer shell. So what can happen is these hydrogen atoms can get together and they can share the electrons like this. And this is what is known as a covalent bond. It's when a pair of electrons are shared between two atoms. You'll see this drawn as an H with a single line attached to another H. The single line is meant to represent a covalent bond, which remember is a pair of electrons, one coming from one atom, the other coming from the other atom. Many students get very confused with the term molecule and use it inappropriately. A molecule is only when you have atoms joined together with covalent bonds. So if it's ionic bonds or metallic bonds, it's not a molecule. In this example, we've got another hydrogen atom with one electron in its outermost shell, so it requires one more. We've also got a chlorine atom. Now, I've only drawn the outside shell of the chlorine atom. It does have some shells in the inside, but when you're drawing covalent bonding, you don't need to show those, just the outside shell. Now, chlorine's in group 7, so it has 7 electrons in its outermost shell. So it needs one more electron to be stable, so it can gain this from the hydrogen. So now we have a covalent bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine. Both of them have now got a full shell, so they're now stable, and what we form here is hydrogen chloride. As before, you'll see this displayed as HCl, with the line representing the covalent bond. There are four other examples of covalent bonding you need to know. They are methane, oxygen, water, and carbon dioxide. Methane and oxygen react in a combustion reaction to form water and carbon dioxide. In the video, a similar reaction is going on. This is actually ethanol in here, but it's a similar reaction. You have the ethanol plus the oxygen forming water and carbon dioxide. Ethanol is also a covalent molecule. The balance symbol equation is below. It's CH4, 2O2, goes to 2H2O, C plus CO2. So what we have here, we have one molecule of methane reacting with two molecules of oxygen forming two molecules of water and one molecule of carbon dioxide. So you can see them drawn out in their full display formula below. You can see the white lines representing single covalent bonds. So remember this is two electrons, one from the hydrogen, one from the carbon. So the carbon in total is donating four electrons to each of the hydrogens. For the oxygen molecules there are double covalent bonds. So therefore, each oxygen is donating two electrons to form a double covalent bond. The same thing happens in carbon dioxide. You can see in this reaction how all the bonds around the carbon and hydrogen, they've all broken, and then the carbon is reformed, joined up with oxygen, and the oxygen is also reformed and joined up with some of the hydrogen. If we look at the dot and cross diagram for methane, you can see here the carbon with four electrons in its outermost shell. They're represented by these X's. You can see the hydrogens have one electron in their outermost shell, represented by the red circles. And you can see how the carbon is donating one to each of the four hydrogens. And the hydrogen is donating one from its outermost shell to form these single covalent bonds. If we look over here at oxygen, now if you remember oxygen, oxygen has this double covalent bond. So you can see here how both oxygens are donating two electrons. So there's a total of four electrons in the center forming a double covalent bond. Here are the dot and cross diagrams for water and for CO2. So you can see in the water uh, molecule you have one molecule of oxygen attached to two molecules of hydrogen. The oxygen has six electrons in its outermost shell. The hydrogens have one. So you can see how the oxygen is sharing one with this hydrogen and one with this hydrogen. If you look at the carbon dioxide you can see the central carbon atom. So the central carbon atom has four electrons in its outermost shell. You know this because it's in group 4. So these are represented by these white X's. 
you can see the oxygen has six electrons in its outermost shell and you can see it forms a double covalent bond as there's four electrons in the centre. On the left here we have some simple molecular covalent substances so hydrogen, water, oxygen. The bonds between the two atoms or three atoms in this case are very strong. Here we've got a load of water molecules all together. So as mentioned, the bonds between the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atoms are very strong covalent bonds. However, what about the forces which keeps this molecule next to this molecule? If we consider something like ice, we know that the molecules are held together and it's a solid. What you get is you get these intermolecular forces. So inter, you think like international, between countries. So this is intermolecular, between molecules, forces. Water is a solid when it's ice. You have many of these intermolecular forces holding the molecules together in a firm crystal regular structure. If we provide some heat, the ice melts. It now forms liquid water. So this is when the molecules can move a bit. They're still quite closely packed, and you do have intermolecular forces, but they're constantly breaking and reforming. So this one might move down here and form an intermolecular force here. This one here might break and move over here. So they're breaking and reforming and moving around each other. If we provide even more heat, the molecules are now going to move really fast. They're going to start moving so fast that they turn into a gas. Now again, we still have these intermolecular forces, but the molecules are further apart from each other, and these are much weaker, and there's much less of them. So the molecules are now zooming around as gases. At temperatures below 20 Celsius, hydrogen fluoride exists as a liquid. So we have lots of these intermolecular forces between the hydrogen fluoride molecules. Remember there is some movement, bonds are breaking, they're moving around a little bit. So it's provides some heat. Remember, some of these intermolecular forces will start to break. The molecules will start to move around really fast. There will still be some intermolecular forces. The really important thing to note is that the covalent bonds have not broken. The only thing that bro that's broken is the intermolecular forces holding the molecules together. So when things change state, they go from solid or liquid to gas, etc., it's the covalent bonds that stay the same, it's just the intermolecular forces that break. Another really important point is that people often talk about intermolecular forces when they're looking at metals or ionic compounds. This is incorrect. So ionic compounds and metals have no intermolecular forces. This is, this is because they're not molecules. For something to be a molecule, it has to have covalent bonds. As well as simple molecular covalent substances, we also get giant molecular covalent substances. These are molecules where every atom is joined to another atom by covalent bonds. So they form these huge structures. One example is diamond. Diamond is made from carbon. So every carbon depicted here in green is attached to four other carbons by a strong covalent bond. There's literally millions and millions of these attached. So it's very different from the simple molecular substances. So if I draw one, if you remember um, water, that was H2O. So in H2O, you've got two covalent bonds, one between this one and one between this hydrogen and oxygen. Whereas in diamond, I've literally got millions and millions of covalent bonds. So therefore, um, giant molecular covalent substances are always solids, have very high melting points, generally very insoluble in water. Another example of a giant molecular covalent substance is graphite. So graphite is also made out of carbon atoms. So it's uh, what's known as an allotrope of diamond. They're both just carbon atoms, but they have a different structure. So graphite, each carbon atom is joined to just three other carbon atoms, whereas diamond, each carbon atom is joined to four other carbon atoms. So this makes graphite um, not as strong but it also gives it some other properties. So in diamond, every carbon has used up all its four electrons for bonding. But in graphite, each carbon has a spare electron. So what that means is graphite can conduct electricity. You've got all these delocalized electrons. If I just draw them in E's, spinning around. These delocalized electrons able to carry electricity through the graphite. 
Graphite is also arranged in layers, so these layers can slide over each other, which means graphite can be used as a lubricant. It's also used uh, in your pencil. Your pencil is graphite, and it's because it's in these layers which slide off, which allow you to draw stuff with it. Diamond, on the other hand, has no free electrons, so it does not conduct electricity. Much harder, much higher melting point due to this, due to it's got more covalent bonds. So in summary, make sure you know how to draw those six dot and cross diagrams we looked at. Make sure you understand how simple molecular covalent substances have intermolecular forces which hold them together. But these are quite weak, which is why they generally exist as gases and liquids. And understand that you have giant molecular covalent substances like diamond and graphite. Make sure you can compare those two 